sure it's not good. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2019 Curtis R. Holtzgang Visiting Scholar Lectureship. My name is Nick Cockler. I'm Regional Director of the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to silence your cell phones, pagers, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have anything that is wrapped and is likely noisy and you want to access to it, uh, now's a good time to open it. Established in 2002, the Holtzgang Visiting Scholar Lectureship honors an exemplary role model in medical ethics. The Visiting Scholar Lectureship is a program of the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics and is named for Dr. Holtzgang, emeritus faculty at the in, uh, Internal Medicine Residency Program at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center. This lectureship, as is the center's programming, is funded through the generous contributions to the Friends of the St. Vincent Medical Center Foundation. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, I would like to share a reflection by Rudy Virchow, a German physician who is known as a founding father of pathology and social medicine. First, it must be a pleasure to study the human body, the most miraculous masterpiece of nature, and to learn about the smallest vessel and the smallest fiber. But second and most important, the medical profession gives the gives the opportunity to alleviate the troubles of the body, to ease the pain, to console a person who is in distress, and to lighten the hour of death of many a sufferer. This year, we are pleased to host Dr. Tom Koch, an ethicist professor and researcher. Dr. Koch holds a multidisciplinary PhD in medicine, ethics, uh, medical ethics, philosophy, and geography uh, from the University of British Columbia. A dedicated scholar, he has authored 15 books and over 300 articles, including the first books on elder care from the perspective of the caregiver. He has worked and published in areas of elder care and gerontology, medical and general ethics, disease mapping, medical geography, and home care of the fragile. Dr. Koch pioneered the use of narrative writing in gerontology. He was also the first to write extensively on the use of electronic data and public information. In medicine and medical cartography, he is an authority on the history of maps in medicine and community health. Currently, he serves as adjunct professor of medical geography at the University of British Columbia. And in Toronto, he serves as medical ethicist and consulting, uh, consultant specializing in issues of chronic care, as well as the study of environmental and social determinants of disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Koch. Good. I thought I was in another city this morning. In the last two days, it was sunny and it was warm and there was no rain. And I felt like an idiot with my Gore-Tex, but now I know where I am. I'm back in the Pacific Northwest. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Holtzgang for creating this scholarship and giving me the opportunity and the people at the quite exemplary Center for Bioethics, who have been not only marvelous hosts, but have also provided me the opportunity of seeing a truly collaborative approach to ethics, both within the hospital, with a focus on the clinical, as opposed to the philosophical, and with an outreach to the other organizations in the city which attempt to provide health care to everybody. So I'm here to learn as much as I am to talk, but I'm getting paid to talk. Now, I was given the choice of a formal lecture or some form of discussion. In the first case, I just drone on for another hour, going on through dessert, which today is fig noodles and Oreos. But with the second, I'd be mostly moderating and it's sort of an academic Dr. Phil without much value added. So what I've tried to do is find a middle course which will allow me to talk for 10 or 15 minutes, probably no more. And then as you attend to your lunch, while I natter afterwards, I'd like to talk to be a springboard for your views on this very difficult problem of what do we mean by medicine and medical ethics? What did we have? How did we lose it? And perhaps how do we regain it? Now, 
I'll be talking about medicine in general. And when I use that phrase here, I use it to include not only physicians, but nurses, nutritionists, therapists, pastoral counselors, and all of those here who may have a different degree in psychology or philosophy, nutrition, but whose job is to serve and to try and assist with the sick among us and with the health of the society at large. So my medicine is a cooperative enterprise in which a range of persons together engage in the care of the person and through those caring acts help to serve for the health of the community at large. And to, I'll find the other page, oh yes. And talking about the ethics of care, I'm speaking of us not simply as practitioners, whatever our practice must be, but as citizens, and let us not forget that we are all potential patients for whom the context of care, economic, political, and social, is not only relevant, but may at some point in our lives become crucial. So what I'd like to do is review this history, see where we are, where we got it, and maybe find some ways to get around the problems. From 500 BC or so until the mid-1970s, we all pretty much knew what we meant when we talked about medical ethics and the broadly constructed ethics of care provided by medical practitioners. It was grounded in this, the work of Hippocrates of Kos, whose canon incorporated the whole body of clinical knowledge extant to the time. It was about 600 pages. And within that 600 pages was one page, which was the oath. Medicine, for our friend here, was a vocational covenant recited not at the time of cowling, but by the, per by the students as they began their studies, and it would be an oath which they carried through to the end of their practice. It promised, first of all, care of the person, irrespective of social standing and status, through a collegial association of practitioners who together would assure the best possible care for a patient, free citizen or slave, male or female. So even in Hippocrates' day, the physicians knew that they needed to be collegial because nobody knew it all, not even Hippocrates, and that for the care of each individual patient, one needed to be able to refer to the college of persons who might be able to help. Now, Hipp Hippocrates was the first greenie. He was the first envir medical environmentalist. He was the one who first realized in a very profound way the degree to which the social and physical environment had positive or negative impacts on the health of the citizens. He was talking about air quality and water quality, but also the quality of the city that was provided. And it was his argument about the environment and the needs of the environment for the health of the person and the health of the person who became the health of society, which led very much to the aqueducts and the bathhouses and the water supplies of the early Roman cities. This idea of the activist physician engaged not only in the care of the person, but also society, became much later very clear in the United States with doctors like, like Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a signatory to the US Declaration of Independence, who took position in Congress so he could advance the sanitarian ideas of the necessity of public health and the provision for health at the level of your legislature. He was not the only one, he was one of many who saw the role of medicine as being both particular and social at the same time. Valentine Seaman was a founding member of the New York Public Health Board, when it was called the Health Board, not the Board of Health, and a principal researcher into the origins of yellow fever. He was also one of the first real advocates for nurses. For him too, medicine was social and ecumenical, and he used these early maps in 1796 to try and show the relation between the incidence of cholera and the refuse sites of what was not picked up in New York City in the days before garbage control. Remember, these were the days when horses carried everything, and horses tended to leave a number of deposits along the street. So Valentine mapped all this in an attempt to find the cause of the yellow fever, which was decimating the city. Uh, it was the first example of scientific medicine looking at evidence to try and find a conclusion. Valentine decided that 
basically, yellow fever grew out of the bad airs of the city, emerging somehow from the effluvia of the air, the miasma. And he thought the maps proved it. What he also noticed, unfortunately, was at that time, the mosquitoes around the refuse piles of the city were the worst that he had seen before. We didn't connect the vector of mosquitoes to yellow fever and dengue, dengue until about, uh, I think it was 1901. So, but Valentine was one of those activists in the social level at the city, and the first of many who in the cities across the nation and across the world would stand as physicians informed, who were informed citizens working for the good of all. This takes us to Sir Edwin Chadwick. Um, I understand his follicle challenges, but I really think his beard needed a trim. He does, you'll see in his right hand, carry a cane. Not as handsome as mine, but that was a long time ago. Radically, Chadwick argued that disease causes poverty and not the reverse. His monumental study of the health of the laboring classes focused on the ill health of many who were in the less advantaged sections of town and the need for government to provide primarily sanitarian in, in, interventions. At the same time, there were doctors like John Farrar speaking to his commission. Now, you will know John Farrar has a very, very modern haircut. That top wave, if we could just put a little purple in it, he would have been ready for any rave in the city. And Farrar was a Manchester physician who argued that we do this, we worry about the care of the poor and their health, not simply out of Christian charity, as he would have called it, but for self-preservation. Because as Farrar pointed out in his attempts to get money for the urban poor, diseases migrate from the poor to the rich. They are incubated in the areas of dense, impoverished housing. But those people in the dense, impoverished housing may be your livery man, your footman, uh, your scullery maid, and all those other things which used to go into the downstairs of an upstairs, downstairs society. This takes us again to one more people, just to show the tradition, that follows from the Hippocratic belief, and that was, of course, Rudy Virchow. Now, I've been chastised yesterday for calling him Rudy, because he's so famous he's supposed to be Rudolph. But when you spend your life with this work and with these things, you get very familiar with these historical people. So it's Rudy to me. And Rudy, as you can see, saw medicine as a social science. And politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. And by that, he meant not that politicians should be taking out your appendix, hopefully, but that to do the job of medicine in the community and society is a political as well as a clinical thing. It is about reaching out and assuring the control of the environment to a way that people are enabled rather than disabled. And that is why medicine is a social science in its clinical approach to the needs of the people. Now, unfortunately, uh, uh, as often happens with radical reformers who are right, he was fired. Um, from, <laughs> Uh, King Frederick sent him off somewhere else. He had been jailed once or twice. But he lived basically as an exemplar of the spirit of, nine, of 1848 and as one of the fathers of social medicine, which saw the work that we do in the areas of poverty and looking at poverty as something that affects us all. At that time in the 1850s, there was a battle begun which has really never stopped. On the one hand were the doctors, like Virchow, like Farrar, like Chadwick, who all said medicine is an integral part of what we call democracy. You cannot have democracy if you don't have people fit enough to be participants. If they don't, aren't participants, democracy itself will be at risk. And on the other hand, you had people who say, and so it was the charge of society to assure that minimum health and the care of all. On the other hand were the economists and the people who were the business people who said, there's nothing wrong with poverty and nothing wrong if more of those people die. It's a way, it's the Malthusian answer to overpopulation. They were still concerned with overpopulation as people pour in, poured into the industrializing city. So it was not only unethical, but it was positively immoral to stop the illnesses. Uh, and, of course, what you wanted to do was promote the businesses. 
In 1831, the editors of The Lancet published a paper, a survey of cholera around the world, looking for its causes. But they also argued against a quarantine in England, which had been briefly proclaimed, because they said better a little cholera than a quarantine which would interfere with business. Uh, they got in that first 1831 to 1843 pandemic uh, cholera with uh, 50,000 mortality. All of this stayed with us, more or less, and the impetus towards the social within the clinical and the economic into and through the 1950s. I am just old enough at 39 to remember the poliomyelitis epidemic of 1951 to 53. I remember not being allowed up on the street where my father's store was. I remember growing up with children who all had a leg brace or, some, or a wheelchair. I remember the fact that when I learned to read, Reader's Digest at my grandmother's. Every month there was a story of somebody in an iron lung, and you'll see one down here in the bottom right and uh, second right, who had become a bridge master or a chess master or graduated from college. And we grew up seeing people who had been saved to a life which was physically restricted, but one we accepted and gloried in because it had been a national, in fact, international attempt to save a young group of people at risk. The, uh, there were wards from Amsterdam to Hong Kong in schools where patients were laid out and traked and hand vented by medical students and dental students and anybody else they could get, two hours at a time, I think it was, until they could either pass the respiratory crisis, which happened with some, or they could find some type of permanent ventilation for them. Over the years, those people who had been wholly disabled, wholly paralyzed, by and large, improved. The machines which allowed their breathing improved, our respiratory technologies and rehab improved, and most of them who survived went on to lead decent lives until they began to be affected by post-polio syndrome about 10 years ago. But it is important to remember when we talk about disability and people who don't want to live, that what we had was a time not so long ago where living with a disability became actually the subject that we cheered, not only for people like Chris Reeves, but for the normal kids who were going to class with an arm brace. This was the world we had and we lived in, and then things changed. It began with the Seattle Committee and the issue of the supposed scarcity of kidneys and other organs in the early days of organ transplantation. Uh, and it began with the God Committee in which they tried to decide who to give the organs to. Now, let me just point out as we go by that there was no scarcity of organs. There was a problem in the supply chain. And several years later, a bill was passed in Congress which made kidneys a national endowment. And as soon as kidneys were a national endowment, the problem disappeared. Now, the 40th president of the United States, who was uh, the voice of the turtle, uh, when he was selling cigarettes, mild cigarettes, they were Chesterfields in his family, uh, instituted a trickle-down economics that in medicine and elsewhere promoted cost-efficient corporate oversight of, patient, of profitable patient care. It wasn't just medicine, it was everywhere where Reagan basically promoted a view in which the, nation, uh, the good of the nation was economic, as some people had argued in the 1850s, and where it seemed uneconomic, the care could be reduced. The argument was that this was more efficient and would not hurt, and has continued the results reverberating today. Um, I don't know why they made this image at 538.com. I probably should not be presenting this to you as a Canadian coming down to the United States, because it's such an editorial comment, which I should not be making, but <laughs> sorry. I will not let it pass with my apologies for political incorrectness. As we began to see this issue of scarcity brought up, a foul complaint, we began to see also the birth of bioethics in its earliest incarnations. And bioethics began with a group of medical amateurs skilled in moral philosophy who took up medicine as a venue 
in which they might ply their trade. It began with the question of organ transplant allocation, of which they knew very little. And it extended to other things like organs at the Belmont Report and how to define death. And they argued, people like Danny Callahan, the founder of the Hastings Center, and his bulldog, Lawrence McCullough, at, now at Baylor College. Lawrence uh, did not look like that back in uh, the early days. These guys basically created a business of bioethics to take over from what they saw as doctors who they defined, McCullough defined, as doctors had a certain type of clinical knowledge, patients had a certain type of personal knowledge. You couldn't say one was better than the other. And in the complex business of medicine, physicians really were not able to make the complex decisions that the bioethicists for somehow believed themselves charged to make in the organization of medicine. Mark Kazuski, who was here last year, and is a former chair of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanity, was at one point honest enough to say, ethicists have been a guest in the house of medicine, and to survive in that environment, have had to align themselves with money and power. My friend Rudy Virchow and Farrar, and probably Chadwick would have said, if you have to align yourself with money and power rather than with what you think is right, you probably shouldn't be in the house at all. And what we have had since really the 1980s has been an alignment which has been pushed forward today in which bioethics has set itself as an amoral standard giver in the house of medicine. Some people are doctors, many of them are not. They have uh, degrees in philosophy and ethics. I myself have never taken a copy of Kant's to the bedside. I have taken Heidegger in my hand simply because the title being, uh, being and uh, becoming or being and nothing looks so good when I'm talking to the patient. They say, you mean we can become? I say yes. But that's as much as I'll do with Heidegger in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the clinic. So bioethics began with some good intentions, but they also basically created a business which devalued medicine and medical ethics from the start. And all of the principles of bioethics and it's now 146th edition, there is no mention of the Hippocratic tradition or the Hippocratic Oath. There is no mention of it in the other books on bioethics. Whereas this stood as an exemplar, not only for medicine, but in societies of how people with special knowledge might work together and work in society for the good of all. Now, the motive force for all of this was the, the economic imperative which became a medical imperative, saying economics required hard choices that physicians were not qualified to make because we were in the lifeboat. This was the argument in 1992 from Louis Lasagna, then dean of Sackler School of Medicine. And he used a story of uh, a shipwreck called the William Brown to talk about how when the lifeboat is overloaded, some must die that others may survive. And what this was was in 1841, a ship with immigrants coming from Liverpool to Philadelphia hit an iceberg just uh, one 60 nautical miles north of where the Titanic would go down, sank with half of the passengers. The other half were saved to the one longboat that was available. There were no lifeboats in those days. There was a jolly boat that the captain took for, with seven other people. So 34 passengers and all the crew are jammed in this boat the next night, the tiller isn't working, the boat is shipping water, and the first mate is scared and says to his crew, throw those people out. So they threw out all the men who had been saved from the drowning ship to make room for everyone else to survive the night. In true Victorian fashion, they were rescued at 7 o'clock the next morning after drowning. And this became a cause celebre when, they got, when the ship got them to Le Havre, France, and we began to, in England and the United States and France, the story of the drowned passengers who had been saved only to be killed became common. There was a major US lawsuit, a, a court case called a US v. Holmes, which came out of this. How it got to the United States and how it was finagled is the story of the wreck of the William Brown, an undervalued book, <laughs> now available and remained here probably for a dollar. And the fact is, it was, all, it was pretty much a lie. The American government wanted to set a precedent on its 
ability to make decisions on the high seas, they chose one guy to be the fall guy who would be charged with one count of homicide on the high seas. The only time the charge has ever been used in American history. And they got a judge who was a political hack who was sure to basically rule in their favor on this case. So that became the story of lifeboat ethics, and it remains the story of lifeboat ethics if we remember those people did not have to die. And in fact, it was after the Titanic in 1919 that the rule came out that every ship had to carry lifeboats sufficient to save people. But what they also did was pass an international edict that in the winter, the sailing route from England, from Liverpool and London, to New York and Philadelphia and Montreal would be 60 miles south of the old line, which meant they would not go through the life, could not go through the icebergs. And so with that one change, which adds 60 nautical miles to the journey, there has not been a sinking since. The point is that when we talk about scarcity, we talk about what we don't want to pay or we, we don't want to put the money off in. We don't talk about scarcity as a natural condition. And that was the motive push behind bioethics. The result has been disastrous, I would argue to you. And I am not the only one who argues this way. A 3,000-year tradition of medical care and of medicine in society has been replaced by managing and by technological procedures. This is now being put forward as the new professionalism, in which we're supposed to be teaching medical students a professional identity and communities of practice with the goal of identity formation. I don't know what any of that means, frankly. But what has happened is we have come forward because bioethics was inadequate practically with an idea of professionalism, which sets the students and the next generation of doctors within a supposed contract with business and with government. It's not one we negotiate. It's not one where we can strike. It's not one where we can talk to the union. But to, because to do so would be unprofessional. Now, many argue that the, the effect of this has been the moral distress and the burnout and the early retirements that we have in many parts of medicine in many areas. This is true of many of the people I know. And it's also seemed to be coming up with residents uh, in many hospitals. They are put in peril, not because they don't want to do the job, but because the job they believe they want to do, the vocational care that they were pledged to provide, seems to be prevented by the corporate and commercial values and strategies which they are being forced to live with. Now, some of the unrepentant bioethicists, like Udo Schuckling, say, suck it up, that there is no room for conscientious objection. There is no room for you, basically, to sit up and say, this is wrong. If you don't like it, get out of medicine. We can always find someone else to take your place. This makes of medicine the, a, tech, a technique in which the physician is robbed of the normal abilities of citizens to object and the normal ability of citizens to speak up. And so bioethics and professionalism today seems to make us lesser citizens as well as unable to improve and to speak to the system where we spend our lives. Burnout is one name for the result. I think it's not so much burnout. I think it's much more moral distress. But we know how that woman feels when she looks at us and after you've been on a, a full 30-hour rotation. It used to be that, yes, we, residents were stressed but there was a sense of a stress with a purpose as one moved forward. Increasingly, residents are talking, I just talked to somebody teaching medical students in New York yesterday, who said the residents in her group in medical humanities want to talk about the difference between their individual selves and the professional selves and the feeling that these two cannot be connected. And I believe that this, I've always thought of burnout as being something for people my age, 49. But apparently, this is also becoming a great issue for the residents who come in with a vocational desire and find not only that medicine can be very mundane and often messy and often complex and patients aren't always nice, but also that the vocational attributes and mission that they had as persons is no longer being valued by their proctors and in their departments. So when professionalism reigns out of bioethics, outside of the ethic we had, 
in the old days, we have a lot of the so-called burnout. We have basically greater problems. We have people dropping out of medicine earlier. And we have this picture of the nurse or medical student there on the right. Whether we call it burnout, whether we call it stress, what we have not done is begun to look at the source of the problem, which is basically the, the distance we have put between the individual who goes to medicine for a vocational career and those who basically find that as professionals, as they call them now, there's nothing they can do. Now, let me also just point out as they go by that none of this is new. We've been fighting this fight at one level or another, at least since Chadwick in the 1840s. This was brought on very much by industrialism to begin with, and the industrial society's division of people from the land and from the small communities to the great city. We have not been able to deal with the poverty and the income inequalities, which have made the systems of health so inequitable in many places. And of course, we have allowed the idea of the economics to run rampant over the necessities of the patient or of society. Spinraza is $708,000 for the first year for spinal muscular atrophy. Solvati, $1,000 a pill, a total of $84,000 per course of treatment. We have a number of Americans taking buses up to Canada to buy EpiPens for $11 that they pay $200 or $14 that you pay, I think, $200 for down here. There is no reason why this has to be. This is unnecessary. This is unprecedented in the industrial world. Uh, and yet, we take this as natural and the promotion of business when, remember, that 49 to 51% of all research money is going into the development of new drugs is not from the companies themselves. It is either federal monies being put out in grants or money coming from organizations like the American Cancer Society, the Spinal Bifida Society, the Multiple Sclerosis Society. We are paying at least half the cost of all the research and then we are being charged through the nose by the companies which say they have to recover their costs, which in fact are what we already paid for. And that is why the US system, if I may point out, is the most expensive, least equitable, and least well managed of any system in the industrial world. I end with some hope, though. It doesn't have to be this way. If we think of physicians as informed citizens, if we think of medicine as the birthright of all, if we remember that the preamble says, uh, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed, with, and women, with cer certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the beginning of the Constitution. These are the moral statements of a nation which believed in the care of all. And the medicine that came up in the early parts of the American history was one which promoted those ideals of the preamble and the Constitution. But we have forgotten, as professionals, the morals which underlay much of the medicine of our histories. We have forgotten that business, the, the, the business of government is not business. That's not what the Constitution says. The business of government is the health and the security of the people. And so what we need to do is to recapture that difference between the individual self who chooses medicine and the professional self who feels denied the practice. We need to do this as citizens as well as in our organizations. We need to do this, a letter by you to your congressperson, assuming you know who your congressperson is, is, worth, is said to represent at least 450 votes because so few people write their congressperson. And by law, you don't have to put a stamp on it. It's delivered free of charge by the American Postal Service. So if all of you wrote a letter tomorrow to your Congress people, who will still be there for another year before they're voted out, arguing for health care as the initiative, calling for national health care and for a reign on, on the pharmaceuticals, we would have here over 450, 4,500, Mm, what is it, 450,000, uh, 1,863 respective votes going to Congress people from Oregon. Uh, Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I give this message everywhere trying to get people to, to write that. 
you need to, when you talk in, in the discussion, I'm glad to see, of your candidates, Democratic candidates, the issue of more and more of health care is coming up. National health care, pharmacological care. In Canada, the big debate is how to get full pharmacological coverage for every Canadian citizen. So we can agitate for this. And what we can also do is find medicine, as it lost its way with bioethics, our position in society has been eroded. The respect we had for the individual physician or nurse and their opinion has been degraded as people say, well, I can go look it up online. I know. What about that drug I saw on TV? What we have to do is a new education program which says that we, as informed citizens, we know things that you don't. If I'm in hospital and I see somebody who has just had an accident and a spinal injury and can't feel their legs, I know they're going to be bummed. It's kind of a bummer to wake up and find out that you don't have your legs. I know they're going to be depressed. I'd be depressed. I also know that they're going to say, the life, my life is over. I can't go on like this. And my job often is to say, the life you lived is over. You're not going to, no, you're not going to be a high jumper anymore. You're not going to be basically a Celtic dancer. That doesn't mean your life is over. That means the life you lived is over. And we know with rehab, and we know with experience, and we know with the literature, that two years after a spinal injury, most patients feel that life is not only worth living, it is at least as worth living as it had been, although it's different. So I want to say to you, so you believe me, give me a chance. Let me show you what we can do when caring medicine comes forward, rather than saying, well, it's your choice, of course. You know, I'm not going to say anything. So we negotiate all the time on the basis of our expertise and knowledge, and yet we do no longer promote that in society as a good, and we need to get our organizations, uh, whether they're medical or ethical or something else, to speak up about the importance, not of philosophy, not of ethics, but what it means to be a seasoned medical professional in a society where we have something to offer besides pills and besides techniques. And so I'll end with that and say, were pol ask people, were polio to return today, would we fill our gyms with people in crisis and have students ventilating them? Would we create a system whereby those people, no matter what their injuries, came forward and were allowed to grow and mature? Would we today create a system where the care of the person was greater than the care of the, of the economics of society? And I say, I don't know yet. I hope we would. And I think the next great pandemic, which is about eight years away, is going to test us in a way that we have not thought of before. So that's my run at medicine of what we had and what I believe is not Hippocratic. I liked Hippocrates, by the way. I remember him as a young guy. Um, <laughs> I remember Rudy as he was growing up. Mostly, I remember the doctors who stayed up at night sometimes, guys like Oliver Sacks, worrying about the cases, worrying about the men, and trying to put them forward in a way which served not only the patient, but the society as well. And I would say that is, that is the mission, eventually, of centers like yours here and of communities in which you are both participant and leader. So here are my emails if you need some encouragement. There, my books are out back. There are sheets to describe them. If you've got questions, I'm delighted to entertain them. And in the interim, thank you very much for listening without running out. Thank you. So I'm here I am all in the in the back. Um, I'm curious since last night we had this democratic uh, debate and one of the things where there was a sharp divide were between the people who advocate for Medicare for all or a national health system and those who say that we should keep some of our private uh, health care as well. And I'm curious as a non-American and a system which I believe also combines private and public what you think. Um. I did not participate in the uh, NCIS was on 
if you guys were going to. <laughs> there are two general models. Canada has a national health care system which does not allow private, although there is a pushback by some people who want it. In Europe, in France, and in Germany, for instance, there is a private component which is available for those who, for some reason, want to not have the public. We do have occasional concierge clinics where they charge extra for non-services that the state will not pay for. Cleveland Clinic made a rotten hell. Cleveland Clinic has one in Toronto. I've worked for, the, for these, one of these, and I'm not impressed. So there are two models. One of them are and the private in a way which assures care for all and yet continues and maybe has a bump up of, of, of the quality of care in the private. I had one patient in England, uh, his father was rich. She went into a very posh clinic after being in the, in the local hospital clinic. Um, she didn't get a better care, I don't think, but she got a better hairdo. Um, my own personal preference is for the national healthcare system in which the private is infolded into the uh, universal public. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to get myself the care that somebody else cannot get. The question of Medicare, however, is complex. Um, and Obamacare. Uh, Obamacare, as they call it, was the best that America could do in 100 years of trying. And yes, it was incredibly complex. Medicare is extraordinarily inefficient in its billing and its handling of many of the medical practices. I think to have a national system in the United States, if you were to do it under the rubric of Medicare, you would have to first reform where the drug companies have asserted inefficiencies and where a national payer system would set absolute national charges for everything from atorvastatin to uh, Solvaldi. That would be a revolutionary thing for America to do. So I think just saying national health care is not enough, it would mean a reformation of how America sees medicine and how America sees the payment of it, and let the companies scream if they want to. In Canada and in Germany and in England and in France, the introduction of national systems went about with fear and trepidation on the part of doctors and some medical companies. And in each country, way, each country found a way to enfold the best into the national system. In a big country like the United States, not as big as Canada, but you know, you're a good size. Uh, how you will handle the rural and the urban, how you will handle the divide between the poorest and the richest states, the, the rich states like Massachusetts being smaller, for instance. Los Angeles population is equal to that of 43 other states combined. That will be something of a challenge. I think it could be done with the reform reformation of Medicare but I think it would have to be done eyes wide open with a national panel which absolutely looked at who's going to get gored and how do we do this in a way that is equitable for all. At that point, I would be glad to come back with my campaign hat. It's red. And assist. It says, time for a little Canada, eh? <laughs> I was going to run for Democratic president because everybody else seemed to be doing it. But people told me I really shouldn't bother. But I had my hat made. So... It's time for, I think it's time for a little Canada, Anne, but you'll have to work out which one of these models can be divided and made to fit an America which itself is extremely divided. Anything else? Yes. Just something, we have like the VA system also, uh, a little bit maybe more of what you're thinking about. We have the VA system also, which might be a little bit more about what you're referring to. Yeah. Americans forget that about 60% of all health in the United States is paid for by federal insurance, either Medicare, Medicaid, or the VA system. Now, I have worked, I have friends in the VA system in several places. I've seen the best and the worst of it. But what it does do is say, wherever you are in the country, if you're a vet and you show your card, you get that standard of care. There are better and worse. But yes, I sort of like that, but I don't want to have to fight in a war to get it. And I think that there will always be a place for special treatment for veterans who are suffering from certain disabilities, certain injuries. They are a class. But I think that the greater class of citizens should have at least what they get today. 
I think the medicine of the old days would insist upon it, medical ethics. You're pointing out uh, the disconnect in American medical history uh, with uh, Reagan and the right uh, turns everything, ep turns all our problems upside down. Um, like burnout, we blame on the burn, burnt out provider and we try to fix them by, I don't know, putting out the fire. But really, the burnt out provider is in the right. Uh, you say they're, the burned out provider is the one who still believes in care uh, and is told, no, turn it down, be professional, behave. Um, uh, that's a, a new way to think about it, and it sure explains why the U.S. is different, not having, not having uh, universal health care? Well, of course not. Um, that's, uh, thank you. You just twisted my head around. Let, let me point out that one of the things early bioethics did was aggressively argue for its introduction to Europe, Japan, and other countries. Bioethics has forced and been very successful in pushing its agenda internationally. And I think that is one reason why we have the problem of expanding uh, medical termination in Holland, because I think that the people who are doing this are the bioethicists, some of the clinicians, who are pushing forward for an idea of autonomy without pushing forward for an idea of community care and service at the same time. But this is, this is more than an American problem. This is an international movement as Reaganomics and economics and trickle-down economics was an international perspective. So I would put that forward as a possible, but yeah, in terms of America, you're right too. But I'm also putting forward the argument that since Hippocrates of Kos, physicians have always been collegial and they have always been able to act politically to argue for the society that they want. Because in Hippocrates' day, the division between the individual and the society was more blurred. The care of the person was seen as a care of society at large. And the charge of the physician was at both levels. And so on the one point, he, you can argue for aqueducts. On the other point, he hired a philosopher in, in uh, Gorgias to argue with the patient to get the surgery that the physician thought was needed and the patient was, didn't want. And so a philosopher was hired to basically convince the patient in that way. Um, I'm glad to know that even back then, philosophers had some occasional use, uh, rare though it might be. Uh, so this is a, one thing I want to say is that you guys do have, you folks, I'm sorry, I can't say guys anymore. Oh, how politically incorrect. You folks have much more power as members of your communities, medical, social, and state, and as citizens than you remember you have. One of the things we've lost since the 60s is the belief in our power as voting citizens and as citizens who can change agendas in the government. And so if you believe, as I do, in this older ethic, we have an educational role to play to get people to understand what medicine is. And whatever you want may not be the best thing for you. Listen to us when it comes down to knowledge, but also to society at large that medicine is not about grabbing money. Medicine, well, everybody likes to be paid. But medicine is also about a type of service and a vision that we have forgotten and we need to promote publicly. That's pretty preachy, isn't it? I'm sorry. I, I don't like to sound, you know, I don't like to sound preachy, but, you know, sorry. I'm done preaching. Uh, ask me a clinical question. I'll show you I can really, I got my clinical chops. It's, we are at a real turning point in a society and in the greater area of medicine about how we want to be for the next 20 years. How do we want our students to be in the next 20 years? I mean, as a Buddhist, I know when I come back, as a Buddhist Shabbata, uh, since I've already passed all the tests, you know, I'm going to come back basically as, as, as a medical resident. I know that. I talked to the Buddha about it. What is the world I want to come back to as, as basically... Well, we haven't talked about where I'm going to be. I sort of forgot that. 
but how do we want, and if you're a younger person, if you're a resident, what is the medicine you want in the next 20 to 30 years when you get to be my age, 49? Um, so for the younger physicians here and residents, it's personal. For those of us of a certain age, it's seeing where we went wrong, and maybe now with letters to the editor, letters to congressmen, questions to these candidates running for these offices, maybe we can make it right. And isn't that a good thing to end on? Isn't that a good way to go forward? We can make it right. I noticed, by the way, I have my Bernie Sanders hair cut on. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you for your questions. Bon chance to you all. Thank you, Dr. Koch. Uh, if, I suppose if you have questions, you feel free to come on up. Um, we're a little bit before the hour, but uh, oh, sorry. That's, that's quite all right. Um, and you can always buy the books. <laughs>